Okay. Okay. So, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll run past the, some of the preliminary slides about what rainwater is and what it does, but I'll go through them quickly just for the callers uh, in case they sort of want a background on what rainwater is and how we use it here in the hill country. So, um, I'm going to talk about just the harvesting basics of rainwater. I'm going to show you some large commercial systems that I think are great success stories for how rainwater can be effective. Um, discuss a little bit about the regulatory challenges that still exist in Central Texas and, and how we plan on changing them, hopefully, for the betterment of the rainwater harvesting industry. Um, and then talk about sustainable site development, sort of a large scale application of rainwater and, uh, and, and integrated stormwater management. And then we'll have a quick Q&A uh, if everyone's sort of up for that. Um, those of you who live in the Hill Country and in Hayes County know uh, that the potential for rainwater capture is pretty high in Central Texas, even though it's sort of seen as a, as a potential drought climate most of the time. We do get quite a lot of rain here. Um, averages anywhere from 30 to 36 inches, depending on what county you're in in Central Texas. Um, and so that you can see that by this graphic here. Well, what does that mean for rainwater? One of the easiest formulas to remember in our industry is the, uh, is the the collection potential for a surface. The easiest way to think about it is 60% of your roof space is exactly uh, how many gallons you can collect on one inch of rain. So if you've got a thousand square feet, you can collect approximately 600 gallons on one inch of rain. So you might imagine that some of the hill country uh, homes that we've got that are 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 square feet can produce a lot of water collected in a two or three inch rainstorm. Um, this graphic, if, for those of you who are following along uh, in, in the, on the video portion of the meeting, you can sort of tell the difference between a wet system and a dry system. The reason I bring this up is that wet system or dry systems are sort of what people think about when they think about rainwater harvesting, a rain barrel underneath the downspout, you know, cut the downspout, gravity does the rest. A wet system is a little different in, in the fact that it takes water from every downspout available in the, on the home, conveys it in underground piping, and then out to a tank. And the reason I like to make this distinction, especially to people who, are, who don't have much knowledge about rainwater collection, is that this gives us tremendous flexibility to collect every inch of rain that falls on a structure. Um, so that the wet pipe system is the one you'll see the most often used in a full domestic setting or in a commercial setting. I'm going to skip the potable supply stuff because we, I want to get on to the sort of bigger uh, rainwater projects. So I want to go over quickly some case studies. Um, and these have happened in the past... 10 to 15 years as I look at this list. Some of these have been completed for a good number of years, but I keep coming back to them in presentations because I think they, they're they sort of projects that thought outside of the box from the design perspective. And I would love to see them replicated if possible somewhere else in the Hill Country. So the first one we'll look at is this Texas A&M uh, Ag Life Sciences Complex. This was completed uh, back in 2009. And what was really beautiful about this system was they made rainwater collection part of the design of the structure. So this is sort of a rendering of the building from the design phase. And you can see this beautiful um, butterfly shaped roof that is actually an, an awning. And I always blank on the term for what is a long shade structure, but it's basically a big shade structure uh, in front of the building with columns right sort of in the middle holding up the structure. And if you look at those columns a little bit closer, oh, I'm sorry, I'm back up. Those are actually very tall rainwater tanks that capture every bit of rain from that butterfly roof. So they've integrated the design of rainwater directly into their sort of architectural planning. Give you some details on this system. Um, it's a large freestanding butterfly roof. So this is the highlighted portion in yellow there. You can see that long central channel gutter in the middle, if y'all can see that on the screen. Uh, and it's about 17,500 square feet of collection surface. So the capture potential on only one inch of rain is almost 11,000 gallons. Um, and so, you know, that's a lot of water. And the question is, what do you do with it and where do you keep it? Those columns are actually just part of this project solution. They convey a lot of that water off the roof, but then eventually, and there's some close-ups of the columns for those who are following on video. So you can see those corrugated metal uh, tanks, so sort of similar to what we see in the Hill Country. Those columns eventually drain to a very large 40,000 gallon buried fiberglass tank. So the potential for collection between the columns and the buried fiberglass tank is about 76,000 gallons. So the, the beauty of this, of this project was that the architects really went after rainwater harvesting as a solution, a sustainable solution um, for landscaping. The difficulty about this project came from that they way overshot their landscaping uh, a goal <laughs> because even 76,000 gallons, who people who have irrigation systems may know, is sort of a drop in the bucket to use it, you know, a phrase that works really well in rainwater. 
they ended up using a lot more water than this. Um, but the idea was beautiful. That's why I like to bring it up. Um, and please, if anyone has questions, I'm, I'm used to sort of interactive presentations. Callers, if y'all just want to chime up and ask me anything while we go, please do. The second case study I want to look at uh, is the Dallas Police and Fire Pension System. This is up in Dallas, Texas. The reason I like looking at this one is this was a very unique design for a rainwater system. The goal was very much the same. They wanted to irrigate their, uh, their complex with rainwater and, and not use municipal water supply. But the design was different in that they didn't want the tank to show at all. So they went to what's called an eco rain or an eco blocks mod modular tank system. Um, and the picture you're looking at now is sort of showing the inside, the bones of that structure. These are plastic, recycled plastic boxes that have about 93% void space in the boxes. Underneath, you'll see a bladder, uh, a, you know, a polyethylene bladder that has wrapped over the boxes and then the whole thing is buried and compact, almost like a Christmas present. That's how it keeps its form. Inside of those containers then, you've got 96% of that square footage is available for water use. So um, there's one more picture there that sort of shows almost the completed project. Um, and this ended up being under a half under a landscape area and then half under a parking lot. So a, a great modular solution um, that was done during the design of our dur during the construction of the building. So the cost for installation was really low. They sized the system perfectly. They have very rarely used uh, municipal water to irrigate their entire complex. I actually drove by this about three years ago and everything looked beautiful. So it was definitely a success, great from design and in implementation. And I had a little video, but we'll skip that. Tell me, okay, good. Now, the next case study I really like to bring up, and this was done some time ago, I think this was 2008 or 2007, but I love bringing this up, especially to people who are the audience in, in, the, in the Hill Country in the Hayes area, because people may notice or, or recognize what this school is. This is uh, Carpenter Hill Elementary School, which is out near 1826 uh, and 150, I think, is the, are the two crossroads there. And this won a ton of awards for, for innovative design on rainwater. The, including the Texas Water Development Board Rain Catcher Award in 2011. Um, the, the really nice part about this system is it's a duplicate system. It, it's a dual purpose. It collects rainwater from the building, uh, all those flat TPO roofs, but it also collects all of the condensate from the AC system of the school. So they are dumping tremendous amounts of water into this tank in the hot summer months. And then when it rains, they get a bonus of all the square footage of the roof. Um, there are two elementary schools that, that basically did exactly the same system. So Carpenter Hill was the first in 2010, I think, when something like that. And then Ralph Pfluger was followed shortly thereafter, and that's on the east side of 35. Their intended use is total campus irrigation. And I will tell you that that picture, although the sod is very freshly laid in that picture, uh, has not changed much. I mean, if you drive by this school on your, on your way around um, Hayes County, you can see that the landscape is still very lush and they're doing almost all of it with rainwater. So a really a success story on a on an elementary school or, or middle school as well. James, I have a question on this one. Was it also used then for their, you know, uh, playgrounds and athletic fields, or is it just the surrounding landscape? Do you know? I, I do. Yeah, great question. So I, the initial intention was that they thought they could get away with watering the uh, athletic fields, and it was pretty quickly discovered that that would tax the system pretty heavily. So now I, I don't have an update uh, beyond about 2013, but in 2013, what I know is that they took away the athletic field com uh, component of this. The, the storage amount, although it's massive, uh, was not enough to do athletic field watering. Okay. Was that Holly that asked that question? Yes, You're thank right. you. Uh, absolutely, um, but some, some numbers, and I'm, I gotta sort of move my, uh, my chat window so I can read them. So 44,000 square feet plus uh, the condensation capture of about 3,500 gallons at peak capacity. So the, t the total storage capacity of each campus is 106,000 gallons. These are 33,000 gallon ta uh, tanks um, each, and there's two of them at each campus. And the capture potential on August 15th, now that's the hottest time of the year and they're running the, the condensate, with one inch of rain is 28,420 gallons. So the capture ratio and the storage ratio were done really well. It's just that the demand sort of outstripped the, the, um, the storage and the capacity, if that makes sense. Did I hear someone about to ask a question, maybe? No, I'm uh, sorry, I okay. was going to be loud. I to ask a question. You said, yes. James, you said that the storage capacity and the 
some other capacity were, were, were well balanced. Can you enlarge upon that? I don't think I said that right. But. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, so let me back up um, and we'll use these figures to sort of prove that out. So the capacity at the campus of each campus is 106,000 gallons total between two tanks. The capture potential where the AC is running a lot and they've got one inch of rain is about 28,400 gallons. I like to size irrigation tanks especially that they'll fill up within three to five inches of rain. The reason that I've stuck with that number so long is that we tend to get bouts of rain or we get long periods of you know very slow rain but it lasts for two weeks and we accumulate two inches. So I think of potential capture and, and storage amount based on how rainstorms happen in Central Texas, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. Um, so that August well, time frame is typically generating 3,500 gallons of condensate per day. Was that the other piece of it in your previous yes. slide? 3,500 gallons, that's correct. Okay. Right. So, and, and I mean, I'll, I'll take a second to show the, the power of rainwater because obviously a condensate system in this size of building is producing a ton of condensate or the AC system. But even on its peak where it's producing 3,500 gallons, all it has to do is rain one inch and you beat that by, you know, almost uh, uh, 10 times, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's 28,000 gallons of one inch of rain. So the power of what rainwater is there, it's just a matter of getting it into a storage tank. So I'll show you one more really uh, nice picture that I've always liked. Uh, they, the designers did this little laser cut of rainwater in front. I, every time I drive by the system, I'm proud of it. Uh, this is done by Innovative Water Solutions a long time ago, back when I was with that company. And I think everyone at that company is pretty proud of it. So drive by it sometime if you all haven't already. The last uh, case study I wanna bring up, and Charlie, um, you're gonna have to just sort of tell me if I'm, if I'm getting out of hand on time, so I'll rush through stuff. Um, this is what was built as Ula Bean Bed and Breakfast, and this is in Driftwood, um, right off Elder Hill Road. This has since uh, been turned into a different type of property. But the reason I like to end on this case study is because it's closer to what we typically do for rainwater in the Hill Country, which is domestic supply for a big property or a big project. This was unique in the fact that it was really a commercial property. Um, it was meant to house 24 guests uh, and also full-time caretakers. So it was a bit of a concern from them to say, can we really do this with rainwater? But sure enough, we could, we just had to capture every bit of roof and again, get the storage capacity correct. So it's intended for potable supplies as the slide says. And um, you, you, know, you can barely see sort of the rainwater capture infrastructure here because it was designed so well, but I'll show you the overhead view. So mm -hmm. this is the entire structure, uh, guest quarters, um, you know, a caretaker cabin, dining hall, a, a very nice pool, which they fill with rainwater. And you can see way over there in the bottom right uh, hand, a uh, bottom uh, right, is the 65,000 gallon tank. So it's located about 200 uh, feet from, from the cabins. As I mentioned that wet pipe system earlier, that's how we get all of that water from the entire campus over to that tank. So there's huge collection lines running across the, the base of this uh, property. And that rainwater is enough to feed all of the units uh, and the pool fill as well. Now they did have a well backup supply. I like to use this as a transition into the regulatory stuff because it's mm -hmm. the first question I get about this is, well, why don't all commercial properties do this in the Hill Country? Why, why doesn't a winery or a wedding venue or something like that do this? The reason is this, the reg, or I'm sorry, the, well, I'll tell you the reason, I'll go back to the slide. The reason is that if you serve a certain amount of people, a certain number of days with water that you're providing with them, you're considered a public water system. Once you're considered a public water system, it's very, very difficult to have rainwater be your source. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But that's one of the legislative agendas that we hope to keep on pushing uh, and have some help from the community in uh, making it, making people realize that rainwater is an acceptable source and a really high quality source. We just have to get that past the regulators' uh, minds, if that makes any sense. So let me, let me show you a couple more of these slides as I'm proud of them. Um, this is our rainwater collection infrastructure at this location. Uh, you can see these beautiful rain chains that come off these big channel gutters. Well, they just go into this box. And so people are thinking, well, where's the PVC piping and all that stuff? This collection box actually hides PVC piping. And the reason that we were able to get the PVC piping so low and have such a beautiful rain chain effect was that the tank is actually quite a ways down a hill. So we end up getting a lot of height differential so we can have that, uh, that water move naturally downgrade into the tank, which is located so low. I really like this bottom right picture because it shows sort of what they've decided to do with the collection basin look um, and rock. And I just like the whole thing. Um, 
So, oh, that last little, I'm sorry, that last little uh, asterisk. It was designed to be under the per person per day limit to avoid being classified as a public water supply. So we did the math, uh, uh, we did a lot of math at the beginning to say, okay, as long as you don't hold a wedding every weekend, right, which is 52 weekends, I think, in the year, then you will be under the qualification for being a public water system. So we really had to think about how they would not get, you know, looked at as a public water system simply to avoid all of the chaos that would have come along with trying to get that passed Texas Commission on Environmental Quality for rainwater. So that is a transition into some of the regulatory challenges that we face. I'm gonna check my time real quick and I'll, I'll wrap the rest of this up so we can get to some discussion. The regulatory challenge as, as they sit now uh, in Texas is that the rainwater is classified as surface water. So it is a high hazard source of water supply. Anytime that you collect rainwater in Texas, in the state anywhere, and you put a pump on that system, you are required to put a high hazard backflow prevention device on your water meter if you have one. So if you're in the hill country, it's not a big deal. If you're on well, you can do it at your leisure. But if you're in a rural water supplier or a municipal water supplier, uh, any mud district, you absolutely have to put a high hazard backflow prevention device or an RPZ on your property. It is cost prohibitive for some people. Um, it affects the unrelated water supply. So it reduces the pressure to the home. Uh, and it also has to be inspected routinely and that costs money. So that's one regulation we've been trying to sort of push one direction or the other to help to make it more accessible for homeowners. Um, again, I mentioned surface water treatment standards. Rainwater is classified as surface water. There's also been some discussion with Texas Water Development Board about getting it classified as its own um, you know, standard because it is different than surface water. It does not touch the ground if we collect it correctly. Uh, and then again, the cross connection limitations in the plumbing code. These are the current rainwater laws in Texas. Y'all may be familiar with some of them, especially those people who live on rainwater in Hayes County. Uh, there is an exception from assessed value of property. So that rainwater system will never be incre uh, included in your uh, evaluation for your property. There is a sales tax exemption on sale of rainwater components or industry is sales tax free. The property code, which was a, is a hard fight and one that still goes on, uh, we have a law that says that they prevent homeowners associations from prohibiting use of rainwater systems. Now, homeowners associations can certainly make it difficult still, but at least they can't say no outright. Um, and then the last one, which is more recent addition, is requiring state facilities to incorporate rainwater harvesting into design. Now, there's, there are some standards about that. It has to be 20,000 square feet or greater, and it has to be a public um, building. So those are, those are as we currently sit. Um, I want to know one more thing before I go through the next part of the slides. We have made an effort in, in, as the industry to put forward a licensing bill for rainwater harvesting in the state of Texas. It has not been met with um, a, a lot of excitement uh, at the, you know, at the legislative level. And but we're still pushing for it because the state of Texas has the most robust and developed rainwater industry in the entire United States. I think we're probably second only in, in how many rainwater systems we have than Australia, which is sort of the birthplace of it and where we take a lot of our technology. So we have an argument to make this a real dominant industry and one that Texas is proud of. We just have to get it officially recognized. Okay, Charlie, do I have six, six seven minutes left? Hopefully. I'm just gonna say sure. my turn. Sure, okay, go ahead. so the, this, is the, this is the scalable part that I was excited to talk about. So we all know that the Hill Country is growing by leaps and bounds. And obviously y'all know that more than anybody because the water table is affected as it happens. Uh, I want to show you some pictures. Does anyone know what city this is? This is this is over a course of seven years development. Can anyone? Or I'm sorry, 17 years. This is Las mm -hmm. Vegas, Nevada, mm -hmm. right? So you can see the green pop up in the desert from left to right, and you can see the lake disappear. Um, this is what happens, right? When people move, is they get water wherever they can. They can. This is Round Rock, Texas. Okay, this is notice the image uh, at the bottom or the date at the bottom, and here we go. We're going to scroll forward just very slowly. That is what is happening. Now that hasn't necessarily happened in a lot of places in the Hill Country, but one would uh, uh, bet that it might be on the horizon. And when this happens, not only are stream beds affected with pollutants and irritants, but also water tables go down because more people draw on the community well or our public water system. So this has led, and I'm gonna skip a couple of these. This has led to a push for more integrated stormwater treatment on site. Um, and integrated stormwater managers, it, it, management is what I would call this. Keeping that water on site, using it while you have it, 
being less reliant on public water supply and also drastically reducing the amount of pollutants and, and uh, contaminants that get into the water table right at the stores. So um, there are some barriers to that. And I talked about some of those regulatory ones, but rather than focus on those, I wanna focus on where I think the, the future may be, including something right here in our backyard. In order, to in, in order to introduce that, there is something that I think everyone should read if they haven't already. Uh, uh, Mr. Butler, who was at University of Texas for years uh, as the Dean of the Architecture of the School of Architecture, I believe, or the Associate Dean, wrote this great article um, for integrative water management and he, where he outlined some scenarios about how to use rainwater harvesting in hill country development. He has a conventional scenario, a light blue scenario, and a deep blue scenario. It's fascinating stuff. He wrote it in 2004 and it was really a push for, hey, we with individual neighborhood and lot developments can do a lot to protect the water table. What he said all those years ago is finally now starting to play out. And that's what I wanna show y'all. There are three communities in the area that you may be familiar with. Constellation, which is in Driftwood. Uh, they require all water supplied by rainwater harvesting systems. It's a small community, but they all do. The preserve at Walnut Springs has to install 5,000 gallons of rainwater storage. And Terracina is a requirement to provide all water supply via rainwater harvesting systems. So these communities have taken that step forward um, from Mr. Butler, Ken Butler, and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to assume that we can do it with rainwater. And it's made a big difference. What is happening now, though, is something that I have presented in slides previously, which I wish could happen. And it's this. This is a conceptual drawing. I just picked a neighborhood out of, you know, a random conceptual drawing. All these lots. And my thought and my presentation to architects and engineers has always been, we have so much site drainage happening in these neighborhoods, right? We have integrated stormwater already going on. Why don't we collect that at various locations and utilize it in the neighborhood? So we have a community water system, a community reclaimed water system. And I've sort of said this, it would be a great idea for years and many people in the rainwater industry have. The good news is that we now have a great example of a huge development doing that. And that is the Driftwood Golf and Ranch Club. So. Y'all may be familiar with this. It's it's right in your backyard. It's at 1826 and uh, 960, whatever the other highways across is there. It's right next to um, Salt Lake. And it's gonna be a massive development. The beauty of this is that Hayes County said, look, you've got to do something about water management because you're right on top of the Edwards. And, and you know, I mean, you're, you're taking a whole bunch of stuff and polluting stream beds and rivers. So the mission statement of this community includes sustainability and environmental stewardship. They require rainwater capture from every structure built in the community, every structure. The level of that is 1.96 inches, which is, not, which is not an insignificant amount of water now, especially that you know how much rainwater can come off a roof. So residents will have the opportunity to use that collected water uh, as they desire, irrigation, domestic supply, pool autofill, or there's also a community-wide connection system that gets that water and injects it into an injection well direct, directly to the Edwards Aquifer. So this is what is being worked on at the moment. Um, and it is a tremendous, I think a tremendous accomplishment. It will be three to five years before it sort of comes to pass and is built out. Um, but I think this is the model for hill country development in order to save the water resources, in order to not pollute streams and rivers, and in order to really use a resource that has been forgotten about, which is rainwater harvesting. Um, that's where I'll end. I'm, I'm sorry to go so fast, but I wanted to get as much information in y'all's ears as possible. So do we have time for questions, Charlie? Yeah, let's Maybe. take a couple of questions if we have any from the okay. audience. Uh, I don't see any in the mm -hmm. chat. If, if you're in, uh, if you have questions and you're on video, please raise your hand. Uh, and if you're not, uh, please enter, a, enter, enter your question into the chat field. I see that Doc has a question. Go ahead, Doc. Are there any permit questions or issues with the injection well part of that, or has that been yet decided? Th that has been long since decided, yes, sir. And, and I, I believe that the county was the main driver behind that. Um, I, I was, I thought that maybe uh, y'all might have had your finger on the pulse of this project. I, I don't know if the groundwater district was consulted, um, but this has been a, a process that's sort of been a three to four year process. And the county was very specific about how they did the injection well um, and how they were to use it. So I think that's been that's been set in stone. Was, was will the water be filtered before it's injected? Yes, sir. Yeah, they get all the blacktop and the oil and stuff out of it. it. It will not be any blacktop or oil. So we don't do any surface collection. This this is not storm uh, site drainage. This is purely rainwater 
collection. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yes, sir. So our, our goal, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Our, our goal is to get every bit of that roof capture per property. And if the homeowner wants to use it, great. They can have the collection tank. They can use it domestically. They can use it for irrigation. But we have the forced main connection at every property. And so the idea is if they don't want to use it, we take that 1.96 inches, capture it, and then quickly transfer it to the injection well. And this is the entire community. So it's, it's taken a lot of engineering to sort of figure out how to get that water to the injection well, but, but it's going to come together. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, so we've got, an, we've got a question in the chat. Now, Charlie, I think from Vanessa, when you say they can use it domestically, is this for non-potable purposes? It can be used for potable purposes as well. So, the, yeah, the, the sky's the limit. Um, they can use it for inside of their home. Uh, now, of course, they're gonna have a rural water supplier. And so they will be subject to those regulations. If they decide to use rainwater inside of the home, they'll have to put that backflow prevention device on their water meter, um, but they will be using little to no rural water supply. Are you working with Texas Water Trade on this? It sounds similar to their Lida Hill proposal. Does that sound familiar to you? It's a follow-up question. It does not, um, but I'd be curious, you know, about about what that oh, proposal is. Can I jump in real quick? Um, this is Vanessa. I was the one asking the questions in chat. I just, by Lida Hill proposal, I really meant the Lone Star proposal that Lida Hill has offered. And I, I, Texas Water Trade is one of the finalists for that. And I believe it's related to capturing stormwater in communities in the hill country and like reusing that for various purposes. So um, I'm not sure all the partners that they're working with, but so that's why I was just curious. It, it has, it has it, not been me to date, but I'd, I'd love it to be me. <laughs> if that's possible, okay, I'd love that well, connection. And, yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll try to make the connection then. Or, Thank you. Okay. And Vanessa, we've met, I think, a long time ago. Your name sounds, your name looks very familiar. Yes. Okay. It, the, your presentation is very interesting. I'm glad y'all are, are doing these uh, kind of learning opportunities. It's great. Sure. Um, John, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, but I don't, I think I'm going to skip it. I just want to second what Vanessa said that if every presentation we had at these meetings was as pertinent and as interesting as this, um, we'd be doing good. It's more interesting than the rest of our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Not over yet. So yeah. I, I'd like to ask, do we have anybody that's just dialed in on the phone that would like to unmute themselves and ask a question? I wanna make sure that we give them the opportunity to do that before we wrap up. Feel free if you've got a direct question just to unmute yourself and ask this time. I'm not seeing anybody unmuting. Um, well, thanks, James. I certainly appreciate it. Um, will we have the opportunity to get your slides so that uh, we have them to look back on? Yes, uh, Charlie and Laura, I think, have my my PDF and the PowerPoint as well. So very good, very good. And you know we're always interested in in being able to point people to resources. So hopefully you'll be one of those in a pool of resources that as we get questions or people hear about this um, spotlight that we did tonight, we'd love to connect people with you and send them your way. Hopefully you'll be open to helping other folks in the whole country out. <clears throat> as those questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I I can't wait to get back to that and, and instead of fixing all the free stuff. So I I'm, I look forward to new new inquiries. <laughs> Well, I will tell you that I have a neighbor down the street that is on 100% rainwater, and he was our savior because um, when we had nothing, you know, we took one of the big orange Gatorade coolers that you see coaches get dumped on them in football games, and and he said you can have as much <laughs> as much as you can use, and uh, so his system survived just fine, and he was able to provide many of us with uh, drinking water during the freeze. So I'm very grateful for that good good i bet it tasted real good too didn't it it does it's fantastic 
it's a different quality of water when you use it inside for sure. All right. Well, um, without further ado, then I think that we should probably move on to, as John said, our, our much more boring business of the night and get um, get on with the meeting. Thank you, James. Thanks, y'all. Really appreciate the opportunity. Have a great night.